Suzanne Hinman holds a PhD in American art history and has been a curator, gallerist, museum director, professor, and an art model. Suzanne owned an art gallery in Santa Fe and then served as director of galleries at the Savannah College of Art and Design, the world's largest art school. Her interest in the Gilded Age and the famed Cornish art colony grew while associate director of the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. The grandest Madison Square Garden tells the remarkable non-fiction story of the fabulous 1890 Palace of Pleasure designed by Stanford <coughs> White and the nude sculpture of the virgin goddess Diana by Augustus St. Gaudens set on the gardens and America's tallest tower. While revealing much new information, <coughs> dispelling long-held myths, and proposing controversial new theories, this book conveys a sense of online immediacy and excitement as this remarkable amalgamation of architecture, <coughs> art, and spectacle rises amidst the elegant yet scandal-ridden culture of the Gilded Age. Suzanne continues to reside near Cornish and is an independent scholar. Please welcome Suzanne Hinman. I do, do hope you will be able to hear me, <laughs> all right? And I hope it will hold out for 30 minutes, my, my, my reading today. Thank you so much for joining me for this reading from my new book, The Grandest Madison Square Garden, Art Scandal and Architecture in Gilded Age, New York, just published by Syracuse University Press as part of their series in the New York history. The, the uh, book is the result of 12 years of research and writing on the Gilded Age and Stanford White's Madison Square Garden, as well as Augustus St. Gaudens' two versions of the nude goddess Diana that topped its tower. And I think you can see her right there. While I hope it will be the definitive nonfiction work on the subject, I wanted to write for a general audience, not an academic one, in a vivid, engaging manner in order, I hope, to make the reader feel that they are indeed standing on Madison Square uh, as part of those remarkable events. So since this is a literary festival, I will be reading from the prologue, slightly abridged version. Uh, my pointer and clicker also does not work, so <laughs> maybe a bit of an, uh, a dead spot here. November 2nd, 1891. New York City, the diamond stick pin on the shirt front of America. Thousands were beginning to fill Madison Square and the streets surrounding it, standing out in the crisp evening air on Fifth Avenue, on Broadway, and on Madison crowding in front of Manhattan's finest hotels, celebrated restaurants and exclusive shops, fingers pointing, mouths agape. Male and female, old and young, greenhorns off the boat and old Fifth Avenue noodles. On that night, New Yorkers of all sorts had come from all over the city and from the now nearby suburbs as well. Brought in by ferry and bridge, railroad, horse car, cable car, and elevated railway. Whoops. <laughs> At seven o'clock, a sharp flood of light illuminated the graceful arcade of roofed arches on Madison Avenue that had been built in the Italian Renaissance style. It was a new sort of walkway, the first in the city, one meant to welcome and to shelter. It was constructed, finally, after a year of wrangling with the city fathers, who feared such a place would surely become a haven for loose women and thieves. Uh, above the arches rose walls of shimmering pale yellow brick. There are lavish terracotta ornament visible in the reflected light. 
let churches claim the sharp and unforgiving Gothic style, and banks the staid and solid Greek and Roman columns. This Renaissance style with richly decorated loges, niches, colonnades, balustrades, belvederes, and magnificent tower was for pleasure, for sports, for the arts, for merrymaking and make-believe. The crowd waited, and then suddenly 100 electric arc lights, 8,000 incandescent lights, and two of the world's most powerful searchlights bathed the new Madison Square Garden in a pyramid of light. It was unlike anything ever seen in New York, ever seen anywhere. Unfortunately, no photos of that night. Whoops. At 93,000 square feet, it was <coughs> simply the largest building in the world devoted solely to extravagance, elegance, sawdust, and splendor, all whipped up and tossed together in the heart of America's Gilded Age and its Golden City. Nowhere were the fruits of American expansion and industrialization more gleefully gathered or more lavishly celebrated than here in Manhattan. And how welcome was this night celebration, a momentary break from the nearly crushing issues of the day, a flood of immigration, domestic terrorism, political corruption, the overt display of wealth, recession, and a coming war half a world away. As to location, The garden claimed the northeast corner of Madison Square. So the square here, Madison Square Garden, right there, between 5th and Madison, 6th and 27th. Okay. And uh, here we go again, the square, the garden, Fifth Avenue and Broadway. It's quite the spot. <laughs> Finished the previous June, New Yorkers had flocked uh, to Madison Square Garden's amphitheater <coughs> for concerts, revivals, the horse show, dog show, flower show, the prize fights, the circus, and a hundred other events held in its vast oval arena. But that night in November, the crowds were there for a different reason, to dedicate and to celebrate the garden's soaring tower. Completed just weeks before, it was a fanciful creation in the style of Seville's Giralda, the Hispano-Moorish 12th century minaret that had been converted 400 years later to a cathedral bell tower by the addition of a hundred feet of Renaissance columned folderol. Is, is it possible, are, are we cutting off a little bit at the bottom? Or, no, or is that it? Okay. At 319 feet, the garden tower was the tallest spot in the tallest city the loftiest tower in the United States, the highest man-made structure in the country, second only to the Washington Monument. The garden's fanciful, almost fairy tale complex was nearly complete. And with the addition the next spring of its festive roof garden, it would quite simply be the most magnificent playland in the world. Madison Square itself was quite the perfect location for this new palace of pleasure. For most of its life, the square had been known for its show of spectacle, its fast horses, a handful of mysterious murders, plenty of beautiful women, and some quite scandalous art. Formerly a drill field, a playing field, a resort, and then a society enclave, Madison Square served as the city's premier shopping and entertainment center, 
and New Yorkers had long been accustomed to coming to this part of the world. Just up Broadway from West 23rd to 42nd stood the best new theaters, brightly lit by electric lamps, a gay white way as it was known. And just uh, a few blocks to the west was 6th Avenue, known as the wildest, wickedest street in the city, for its concert saloons, all-night dance halls, French peep shows, high kickers, and various other forms of depravity, or so it was reported. The grand new Madison Square was, uh, garden was actually the second to stand on this spot. And here you see the first, as it was variously remodeled. The second was very much the creation of architect Stanford White. Uh, Mr. Mustache, <laughs> soon to become America's most celebrated architect. He and his partners at McKinney and, and White had solidified the Beaux-Arts style, borrowing from the past to combine classical orders in monumental scale. With richly colored marbles and carved 15th century Italian ornament, murals and mosaics light and air to create a grand new eclectic Renaissance revival style. It was also very much an American style, sparking what some were calling an American Renaissance, which they believed would surely uh, certify the country's role um, in the world as heir to the grandest of Western civilizations. With nearly a thousand commissions on the book, books, McKim, Mead, and White would continue to shape the New York landscape from the Washington Square Arch, nearly, just nearing completion to the fabulous Penn Station more than a decade away. And beyond the city, the firm would leave its mark across the country, culminating in the remodel of the White House and the National Mall. But on that night, all eyes were focused on the south side of the garden. At exactly 10 o'clock, the lights went out, and then suddenly the garden's new tower was lit with incendiary red fire. Boom, crash, boom again in a shower of color as bombs and rockets were set off over and over for an hour. There among the smoke stood a tall, red-headed man, hot, grimy, his bristling mustache singed black, running among the installations, making certain every flare, bomb, skyrocket, and Roman candle was fired in its proper order. Stanford White had to fight hard for the garden, even harder for this tower. Faced with ever-rising costs, more than four million for the project, the Madison Square Garden Company had been ready to write it off but White would not let that happen. Stanford White always had a fondness for towers, and he had built some fine ones. And you may recognize Trinity Church in Boston as his first. There had to be a tower that he knew, and he begged, pleaded, harangued, and hounded until the money was raised. For nearly two years, Masons had been at work setting its two million creamy yellow bricks as the tower slowly reared its head over the roofs of the city. With all the cost cuts, it was not quite the fantastical tower he planned, but still it was damned impressive, in his own words. No doubt prom... Oops. No doubt prominent that evening were members of the Madison Square Garden Company Board of Directors, led by its president, legendary banker and financier J.P. Morgan. The board was composed of old and new money, railway pres uh, presidents, industrialists, bankers, men from the California gold fields, financiers and speculators, all among the richest men in the country and leading figures of what White's old friend Mark Twain had dubbed the Gilded Age. Men whose money and power allowed them to live like princes had paid for this palace, for the boxes and promenades to show off wives, daughters, and horses, 
but the pleasures of the garden were not strictly for the rich. Anyone with the price of a ticket was admitted. The new middle class, the office and factory workers, the engineers, the salesmen, the clerks, typewriters and seamstresses, in fact, any soul searching for some amusement when the day's work was done. It was they and their families who would have to fill the thousands of seats. The garden was not just for the few. It would belong to all New Yorkers and beyond, for it would capture the imagination of the entire country. Finally, the smoke cleared away, and the tower was lit up again as it would be every night. There was a concert, play, performance, prize fight, or extravaganza of some sort. One after another, the lights came on until all 1,300 were ablaze. The second Edison searchlight mounted on a trolley at the highest set of open arches. Uh, ran around on rails at nearly 300 feet, shining out for a distance of three miles, picking out the Statue of Liberty and the ships in the harbor. Dark again at 11 o'clock, just as the red lights of the tower illuminated its seven floors of private apartments and five columned loges, cupolas, and lanterns, one set on top of the other and each serving as an outlook over the city. 25 cents would buy a 30-second elevator ride to the top of the tower for a stunning view never before seen by the human eye. Earlier on that opening day, some 10,000 visitors had paid their quarter for that view across the great expanse of the city. The next evening, election night, the tower's great searchlight would be put to a, a unique purpose by arrangement with the New York Herald, signaling the results of the election for governor of New York State to homes in the city and beyond. That next night, when the great magnesium light swung around the tower to flash out news of the Democratic victory, there would be a roar of applause in the city like the roar of the sea. Never before heard. On the previous afternoon of November 1st, 1891, another crowd had gathered in Madison Square, more gentlemen than ladies, and many well-equipped with field glasses. The newspaper had made it known that the huge sculptor, sculpture topping the tower's bullet-headed lantern of steel and iron would finally be unveiled, that it would be a figure of the Roman goddess Diana and that her costume might be skimpier than imagined. <coughs> After her very dramatic unveiling that is fully discussed in a later book chapter and didn't have time for today, there came a murmur and then a gasp from the crowd. There standing on one tiptoe was a gilded, hammered, copper statue of Diana virgin goddess of the chase, goddess of the moon, and sister to Apollo of the sun, reigning nude except for a flying drape wound under her breast and over one shoulder, not tucked away in a gallery or museum, but, quote, stepping out freely and fearlessly into the gray air for all to see, her golden limbs shining against the darkening sky the first sculpture to ever be so illuminated by electricity. This astounding yet very elegant figure had been created by the man who was quite likely America's greatest sculptor, Augustus St. Gaudens, and our neighbor here in Cornish. He had studied the great figural works of Greece and Rome and the Renaissance and then transformed them through his own modern eye setting a new standard and a new direction for American sculpture. His Farragut Monument, dedicated 10 years earlier, in, stood in nearby Ma Madison Square, and you can see the tower uh, right behind him. There followed some of his greatest public pieces. 
the Standing Lincoln in Chicago, the Puritan in Springfield, Mass., the Adams Memorial in Washington, D.C. All, like the Farragut, done in collaboration with St. Gaudens' dearest friend, Stanford White, who helped pick the sites, design the settings, and the bases. It had been 15 years since their first job together, working on Trinity Church in Boston, and now once more here on Madison Square. There had been some very recent rumors that the figure of Diana would be something quite different and far more modest. But this decidedly unclothed Diana stood poised on her left foot, her right uh, leg bent back, her bow drawn, arrow pointing into the wind. She was a wind vane, but one, quote, before which all other weathercocks pale and dwindle, gushed the New York Times. <laughs> Achingly beautiful, her slim, almost boyish young body, 18 feet tall, of gilded hammered copper, turned readily in the light breeze. Yet she would soon be replaced on the tower by an even lovelier vision, and I apologize for this 100-year-old newspaper image. The new uh, lovelier version would be just five feet shorter and the first Diana would then be shipped to Chicago, where she would reign over the glorious 1893 White City at the World's Fair until, whoops, there she is, right there, until quite mysteriously disappearing after a terrible fire. And where she is today is a quite a mystery and something I do explore in the book. But on the night of that tower's dedication, while a shower of fire whirled about her head and red and blue fires burned at her feet, Diana Sculptor likely stood with members of the board and city officials, watching the ceremonies with perhaps some pride and a good bit of in unease. It was said there was not a man in the city with warmer friends than Augustus St. Gaudens, with his honesty and lack of affectation, but there was nothing he liked less than attention. And he was still recovering from the terrible error made at the foundry in Ohio where Diana was cast, where they ran the mounting pole through her heel instead of her toe. That was awful for him. Perhaps off to one side stood a cluster of men and women dressed with a certain bohemian flair. They might have been the chums and colleagues of the sculptor and the architect from their days in Paris or St. Gordon's studio in Rome or one of the private clubs that kept their membership secret, reserving special apartments for their physiological explorations, as one member described them. It was artists who made up St. Gordon's and White Circle of Friends, painters like Louis Comfort Tiffany, William Merritt Chase, and John Singer Sargent, as well as sculptors Daniel Chester French and William uh, McMonies. And that was Daniel Chester French's figure here, and McMonies' fabulous uh, uh, Boat of the Republic, uh, now uh, destroyed as well. Madison Square had always been friendly to artists. Just two blocks away stood the National Academy of Design, and there were art dealers, galleries, art supply stores scattered around the square and the neighborhood. This artistic group might have also included some of the best-known female models of the day, of which more than a few would claim Diana's figure as their own. Oh, almost done. Although there were rumors, there was little chance the sculptor's wife, Augusta, then in her 40s, would have been the inspiration for the sculpture. Perhaps a rather striking woman stood a little farther off. One who spoke with a Swedish accent. Davida, as she, would, as she was called, claimed the sculptor's heart and his second son as her own. No doubt, out on the street, clasping thin wraps against the chill, stood hundreds, if not thousands, of other young women, immigrant or native, from 
foreign lands or farms or mill towns around the country. Some dream desperately of fame on the stage of love, marriage, wealth, security, or any reasonable combination thereof. While others, more independent of spirit, bachelor girls, as they were called, sought respectable occupations or perhaps even professions to support themselves. But there must have been more than a few among them who wondered, perhaps with some fear mixed with a bit of delight, whether someday they too might find themselves standing in a sculptor's studio or a classroom full of art students dropping a robe to pose in the toot and scramble, as it was called. While Stanford White's reputation with the female sex was well known, it was not just young, slim, innocent women who appealed to him. Life is often more complicated than that, as was his relationship with Augustus St. Gaudens. Stan and Gus loved their work, their wives, their sons, their mistresses, their assorted friends, and each other. Some may have known the more hidden details of Stanford White's life, the things that went on in his various hideaways, like the special apartment in Diana's Tower, draped in leopard skin and golden damask and filled with fresh orchids. But it was not until America's most famous architect was brutally murdered in an act of passion, here, right here in the shadow of Diana's Tower, at the top of Madison Square Garden, that the more shocking allegations were screamed out in newspaper headlines worldwide, although the full nature of the crime of the century would remain hidden. It had been quite the journey to the golden virgin goddess twirling about the tallest tower. The story of Diana and the grandest Madison Square Garden has remained a tale largely untold. And on that November night in 1891, the story was still far from over. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, so I need to commend you on the amount of research <laughs> and knowledge that you had to acquire. And I'm talking about the architectural mm -hmm. styles that went into mm -hmm. your book and the whole creation of Madison Square Garden. A question I have is, how come it fell down so many times? Never fell down. It Never would have lasted down? 200, another 200 years. It was torn down. Torn down. Torn down, like Penn Station, mm -hmm. one of those magnificent things we lost. Uh, the New York Life Insurance held the mortgage. It lost money from day one. <laughs> uh, what override and cost, of course, it was so beautiful. Uh, it was very expensive to run. The taxes were high. It never quite made enough money. Uh, they held the mortgage, they tried to sell them, nobody wanted to buy it, uh, and uh, they want, the insurance company needed new headquarters. So they decided, what the heck, <laughs> down it comes. Uh, there were plans to save it, to save the tower. They were going to rebuild the tower on the N uh, New York University, NYU campus. Too expensive, they couldn't pull it off. They were going to save Diana. And they did. They saved Diana. Anyone know where she, second Diana they saved? Anyone know where second Diana reigns today? Where is the original Diana today? The first Diana, gone. The one in St. Gaudens is a half-size copy. The, the second one that's up there is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. She was rescued from a warehouse in Brooklyn after many years. Philadelphia took her. New, York, New Yorkers thought, okay, we'll let her stay there a year or so, and were shocked to find that Philadelphia was never giving her back. <laughs> and the great quote was from the mayor was, uh, if the, you, would you give a, uh, would you give New York back to the uh, Native Americans for $24? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and they had a, a, to agree not. So. Uh, and uh, the hardest part, I'm an art historian, so and I'm a, a great fan of Italian Renaissance architecture and etc. So that was a little, I could say, easier for me. The, the difficult part was the construction technique because the tallest tower in America, how did they come up with the technology and the means to construct that? So that took a little more study on my part, but it, it was a many, an amazing story. How did they get Diana up there to the top? Um, again, an amazing. Hauling ropes and a steam-driven, a steam-driven... Um, yeah, okay. Is there a copy at the Met? Yes, it's a half-size copy at the Met, a lovely copy. Uh, New York felt they had to have one <laughs> somewhere, and uh, she is uh, right there at the Met. So um, when I see that tower and those cutouts, and Sanford White had an apartment in there, right? Yes. What floor was he on? On I the wonder. seventh floor. Seventh the floor. Well, he had a lower. He had one on the lower, and then a, a, a vacancy opened up on the top floor, and then he moved up. But uh, people kind of assume it was a very secret uh, apartment, but his wife often hosted parties there, and, and it was a, a society gathering spot as well. Did they have elevators? Yes. Oh, it was a private <laughs> elevator <laughs> with orders, do not stop on my floor, but Stanford White. <laughs> no one was allowed to get off on his, on his floor. Uh, but there were um, uh, telescopes at the top and a, uh, a guide stationed at the top who could point things out. Again, no helicopters, no planes. No one had ever seen that view from the on the top of the tower. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Did he ever say what was his favorite? Mm -hmm. His favorite um, building or structure? Oh, Stanford or? White? Yes, yeah, Stanford White. Huh. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't recall. He made beautiful homes, libraries, um, college campuses. Uh, um, just about everything you can think of, courthouses, churches, etc. Suzanne, when did it come down? 1925. <coughs> and uh, then that Diana went into storage until 1932. And how long did Madison Square remain kind of a green space? When did one was kind uh, of enveloped um, by, by immediately development? Immediately, the uh, New York life building went up. Uh, oh, do you mean the square? Yeah, the wide open mm -hmm. area. It's still open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was it really? Today, oh, oh yeah. How many square blocks? Just the same, same thing? Well, one more place. Same exact size. Really? Yes. Oh, oh it's lovely. It's a wonderful place. They have art festivals and art installations today. Madison Square Garden Conservancy is very active. Really? Is there one more question? Are there any theories about what happened to the first Diana? Yes. I have lots of theories <laughs> <laughs> Part part of her may survive. Part. Well, thank you. Thank I you think I'm